My name is Vera Scott. I'm a senior researcher here at the School of Public Health, UWC. In this session, we're going to talk about the emergence of a particular branch of primary health care called selective primary health care. In unit one of the module, we describe the determinants of health and we introduced you to three health perspectives, the biomedical model, the behavioral model, and the political economy model. In their book, Questioning the Solution, Werner and Sanders suggest that the way we define the cause of ill health influences or determines the solutions that we seek. Primary health care, as described in the Alma Arta Declaration, implicitly understands ill health to be the result of a range of causes acting at different levels. And it then sets out a program of work which includes a focus on social determinants in suggesting the need for health promotion and for activities that require intersectoral action for health, such as a water and sanitation program. The Alma Arta Declaration also calls for an end to wealth inequalities uh, between and within countries, understanding that the inequitable economic order contributes to the vast health disparis disparities that we see between countries and within countries. We're now going to look at the emergence of selective primary health care. And to do so, um, we're going to read together an article by Welsh and Warren called Selective Primary Health Care, an Interim Strategy for Disease Control in Developing Countries. Um, I'm going to ask that you uh, refer to uh, a pr either a printed version or an electronic version of this article, and you will see that we have embedded a link here uh, to make access to the electronic version easy for you. I'd like you to start by scanning the article on your own, and this should take you about 10 minutes. As you do so, I would like you to look very carefully uh, at the following features of the article. First of all, the title. What do you notice about the title? What are the phrases used? And what do you think the authors are trying to signal to their audience? Who are those authors? And you might want to Google the names uh, to find out a little bit about the background of these two particular authors. When was the article published? What year? And what journal was it published in? This is something that as you become more familiar with public health uh, issues, it's, it's good to take notice of what the public health journals are that, um, that have a good reputation and that um, address the sorts of issues that you're interested in. And then what is the argument that they uh, present? Um, first of all, read the abstract, um, and then look at how they develop their argument. And here I'd like you to read the full introduction on your own, and then scan the rest of the article. So you're not going to read the full article, but scan the article, reading the headings. If you're working on a paper copy, you might actually want to use a highlighter and just highlight the headings and look at the particular tables. Tables are, are often included because they present key information. So try and see how the particular tables are contributing towards the argument that Welsh and Warren are presenting. And this should take you about 10 minutes. Let's start with the title. Selective Primary Health Care, an Interim Strategy for Disease Control in Developing Countries. Note the word selective. Up until now in the academic literature, we only had primary health care. So they're introducing a new concept. And the question in my mind is how is selective primary health care going to be different? They then suggest that this is an interim strategy. So it's not meant to be the final solution. It's supposed to be a temporary kind of strategy. What is it for? It's for disease control. Is it for everybody? No, it's for those living in developing countries. The authors of the paper are Julia Welsh and Kenneth Warren. 
Julia Walsh at that time was working for UNICEF, the United Na uh, Nations Children Fund, and Kenneth um, Warren was with the Rocker Foundation, Rockefeller Foundation, uh, working in their health systems unit. And he had a particular interest in infectious diseases, tropical diseases, as they were called in those days. The article is published in the New England Journal of Medicine, so it's a prestigious public health publication. And it was published in 1979. How is that significant? 1979. It's the year after the Alma Arta Declaration. So in 1978, we have the Alma Art Declaration, which sets out the principles of primary health care. And the very next year, we have a, a very influential publication, which introduces the notion of selective primary health care. Now let's turn to the abstract. The abstract sets out a set of criteria for prioritizing certain infectious diseases and then it says that it will in this that this article will compare a selective approach to these particular diseases versus other approaches the introduction talks about the three million people in the less developed world who suffer from a plethora of infectious diseases because these infection, infections tend to flourish at the poverty level, they're an important indicator of the vast state of collective ill health. So it's beginning to identify the burden of disease. Notice that it's only looking at the infectious diseases. It's not looking at non-communicable diseases uh, or injuries. But in the 1970s, the infectious diseases were still um, the major burden um, in developing countries. And it then gives us an economic argument um, for actually addressing disease. The concomitant disability has an adverse effect on agriculture and industrial development, and the infant and child mortality inhibits attempts to control population growth. So this was the, area, the era when population growth and development were being debated. And, um, and there was a concern that developing countries would never be able to, to catch up um, in their development status because of um, the high fertility rates and, um, and, and sharp increases in population growth. They then put forward, having described the problem, they then put forward the best solution. What can we do to help alleviate a nearly unbroken cycle of exposure, disability, and death. The best solution, of course, is total primary health care for every human being. And they go on to quote the Alma Arta, saying what it encompasses. In the next paragraph, this, they say, the goal set at Alma Arta is above reproach. Yet it is its large and laudable scope that makes it unattainable in terms of prohibitive cost, and the number of trained personnel required. So although this is the approach we want, it's simply not possible. That's the argument that they're beginning to make. In the next paragraph, they argue that absolute poverty is here to stay. Absolute poverty is a condition of life so characterized by malnutrition, illiteracy, disease, high infant mortality, and low, low life expectancy as to be beneath any reasonable definition of human decency. How then, in an age of di diminishing resources, can we best attempt to secure the health and well-being of those trapped in this poverty? And by diminishing resources, they're referring to the oil crisis in the 1970s, um, which, um, which brought about a global economic recession. So whereas in the 1960s there was a lot of optimism about um, development and, um, and being able to bring developing countries um, to the same sort of standards as the developed world, um, in the 1970s there was a lot more caution around how much money was actually available to do that. So now we scan the headings. We've read the abstract, we've read the introduction. The first heading is the nature of collective ill health. 
And again, it describes the infectious disease burden. Um, it also describes just how overwhelming this all is. The next heading is around establishing priorities for health care. And, um, and in doing that, it suggests that we need to establish what those priorities are and that we have certain options for intervening. And it sets out five options, total primary health care, basic primary health care, multiple disease control through horizontal programs, vertical programs of selective primary health care, which is what this article is about and what, it, what it's promoting, and then the last option, research into diseases, so that if there currently isn't uh, a treatment or it's too costly, we need to research that in order to bring the cost down and make it possible to treat. In the next paragraph, the heading is targeting diseases for control. And they set out a set of criteria that can be used to, to target. Um, and there are four criteria. The first is prevalence. Uh, how common is the disease and, um, and what proportion of the population um, are affected. Uh, the second is morbidity or severity of disability. So what effect does this disease have on the population? How sick does it make the population? The risk of mortality, which is the risk of dying from the disease. And then the feasibility of control. How possible is it actually to control this disease? Um, and, uh, and how effective is it and what is the cost of that intervention? They then apply these criteria, and, um, and in Table 1, they give an example of what it would look like if one used the criteria to prioritize which diseases should be targeted. They give three examples. The first example, if you read Table 1, is Lassa fever. Its prevalence is unknown, but it's thought to be low. At least, this was in the, in the 1970s. Its mortality rate, however, was extremely high, 30 to 60 percent. Morbidity was moderate. Those infected were bedridden for one to three weeks. And the feasibility of control was extremely poor at that stage. Very little could be done about Lassa fever in the 1970s. The next infection, which they use as an example, is, um, is a worm infestation. Here, the prevalence is extremely high, thought to affect more than one billion people in the world. The mortality, however, is extremely low, less than 0.001%. So very few people die of worm infestation. In the 1970s, we thought that the morbidity was quite low. Nowadays, we think slightly differently because we know that worm infestation is associated with anemia, which causes reduced brain growth in children. So it is actually quite a significant problem. But when this article was written, the morbidity from uh, worm infestation um, was, was low. And the feasibility of control was, was fair. The third example is malaria, with a high prevalence, um, more than 300 million people being affected annually in the 1970s. Mortality low but high morbidity, severe malaria, many complications often recurrent, and good feasibility of control. What they're trying to demonstrate to us is how one might go about prioritizing which diseases um, to actually intervene on. And they're presenting an argument for targeting a disease such as malaria. Malaria has less prevalence than worm infestation, but it has a high morbidity and we can control it. Um, malaria has much less mortality than Lassa fever, but Lassa fever is not very prevalent and even if we wanted to do something about it, we couldn't because there isn't actually a treatment available. Now let's look at table two. In Table 2, they've taken the four criteria for prioritization and they've, uh, they've applied it 
to the diseases found in the developing world. And on the basis of this criteria, set of criteria, they've identified high priorities, which are diarrheal disease, malaria, um, whooping cough, bilharzia, and neonatal tetanus. And they give the reasons for this. These are conditions with high prevalence, high mortality or high morbidity, and effective control is possible. Let's carry on looking at the headings. On the next page, you will see that they then have a major heading, Evaluating and Selecting Medical Interventions. And then there are a number of, of, um, of subheadings. What they're doing in this section is that they're, um, they've created a, a model for a developing country in Africa with a typical population. It's a rural um, population, uh, 5, uh, 500,000 people. And they're then costing different packages of care offered to this population. And they're comparing the different packages. So they then start by comparing total primary health care, where everybody receives whatever care they require, with what they, with what they term basic primary health care. Um, and this is something that, um, that David Sanders uh, speaks about in, a, in, a, in a, one of the earlier presentations. Um, if you turn the page, they then look at the cost of horizontal multiple disease control. Um, and part of that would be vector control. So not just taking out one vector, which is responsible for one disease, but working across a number of different vectors, which are responsible for a range of infectious diseases. And they cost that. They give examples and they cost that. Um, they then look at water and sanitation programs and what can be expected in terms of return on investment. Uh, and they look at nutrition supplementation. They make quite an interesting argument um, uh, in the section on nutrition supplementation. Uh, they point out that malnutrition is an underlying or associated cause of many deaths from all infections in children. And so there's a cycle between uh, being malnourished and being susceptible for infection. Uh, and infection also predisposes you to malnutrition. But instead of then suggesting that we need to address infectious disease in children and malnutrition, they suggest that it might be possible to break the cycle by just addressing the infection, which will then not predispose to as much uh, malnutrition. Uh, forgetting that malnutrition is going to be very prevalent in any community uh, with high levels of poverty and, uh, and is probably going to be, um, is going to thwart their efforts to reduce infection. Um, the next heading is they look at categorical disease control and, uh, and here they're looking at trying to, to wipe out endemic disease um, uh, looking at um, uh, things such as water and sanitation programs. And they conclude it's actually quite wasteful to provide water and sanitation uh, because it's difficult to do and, um, and one also has to have behavioral programs in order to uh, get populations and communities to use the new water and sanitation programs. And finally, they look at what might be achieved through research. What they then conclude is that at present, although comprehensive primary health care uh, is, is laudable, it's not actually feasible. And they present us with an economic argument for what they call the selective primary health care approach. So what does a selective approach um, comprise of? It's selective in terms of three different parameters. It suggests that, um, that it's important to select which diseases to target. For example, diarrhea. And, they, and, and the article sets out four criteria for prioritizing disease. Next, it talks about 
selecting particular population groups. And um, in one of the examples in the, uh, in the article, it talks about um, uh, trying to control infection in children under the age of three. And then it selects a certain set of interventions. And these tend to be technical medical interventions, um, such as oral rehydration solution. When this article was published, it, um, it stimulated a lot of debate. And, um, and many concerns have been raised about the selective approach. Um, people such as Ben Wisner wrote um, in the 1980s, and David Sanders and Fran ba Baum have also criticized the selective comprehensive approach, and some of these articles are, are in your reader. The selective primary healthcare paradigm reflects a strong medical focus. Um, it doesn't address the social determinants of health. Rather, what it does is that it selects interventions which tend to be either curative or preventative. And there's a danger that in selecting out interventions, um, we're not responding to a, a full understanding of causation of disease, which has to include the socioeconomic and political causes of the diseases. One of the questions that those of us who promote a comprehensive approach would ask is to what extent the selective approach upholds the principles of primary health care. Um, is it equitable? Does it give access to the most marginalized of population groups? And, um, and there we can say that the selective approach does suggest uh, targeting, um, which can identify those in, in greatest need. But often the selective approach has been applied in a way where the target is a very narrow age group and doesn't actually take into consideration um, the life cycles of, of people within communities and the interdependence of one age group on another age group. The comprehensive primary health care approach includes a f focus on promotive and preventative, whereas the selective might pick up on some preventative interventions, but doesn't address the broad, broader causes of disease. Um, the primary health care approach, as we read it in Alma Arta, en encourages engagement with communities for empowerment. The selective approach um, does often engage with communities, uh, if we think of immunization programs, for example, it's necessary to, to mobilize communities, but it's not mobilizing communities in order to give communities a stronger voice. It's often mobilizing communities to make communities compliant and accept the services that are being offered. The Alma Arta version of primary health care talks about the need for intersectoral action, and as we read in this article, um, this is not seen as being cost-effective. Um, intersectoral action for health is difficult to cost because one intervention such as water and sanitation has multiple effects. So it will reduce disease. It will also reduce the amount of time that, that girls and women spend collecting water and that will have a positive spin-off on female education and that will have another positive spin-off on, on child health. But that's quite complex to cost. So the type of cost-effectiveness studies that um, Walsh and Warren spoke about um, can really only be applied to actions which have a very direct health outcome, um, not to the multiple health outcomes that some of the intersectoral action has. And then the last principle of, of, of um, a comprehensive primary health care approach is that it makes use of appropriate technology. And, um, and as we've seen in reading the article, what's being proposed is, is technologies which address um, uh, cure and, and prevention, but not necessarily ones which, um, which address the social determinants of, of health. Selective primary health care actually became the main approach that was implemented in the 1980s and, and 2000s. 
Um, a very good example and the first example of a large-scale program based on the selective primary health care approach was the UNICEF program, um, GOBI FFF. Uh, and some of you might be old enough to remember what this stands for. Uh, GOBI stands for Growth Monitoring, Oral Rehydration Solution, Breastfeeding and Immunization. All very good interventions. Um, but this was a program which only offered these four interventions uh, and targeted children. And, uh, and UNICEF very quickly came to realize that this was not enough. Um, they were not going to improve the health of children, which was their main target, unless they also improved the health of women. And, um, and so we then have the FFF being added to the approach. Um, and it stands for Female Education family planning and food supplementation, recognizing the link between infectious disease and, and malnutrition. The selective primary health care approach is often, not always, but often uh, implemented in separate vertical programs. And, and these vertical programs have their own separate administration and management and supply systems. Um, a good example of this would be the immunization programs, which, which run as parallel programs to the health service. So they're doing extremely good work. They're immunizing children, um, but they are separate from the rest of the health service. And this can cause fragmentation. So a sick child comes in, can't be immunized, uh, but can also not be treated, has to be sent to another service to actually receive treatment. Um, and this, again, leads to inefficiencies for the staff and for clients. Um, the, the implementation of the selective primary health care approach through many vertical programs is something that we've been debating more recently in the context of HIV AIDS. Um, we've been able to develop some very strong uh, uh, treatment programs, testing and treatment programs, um, but very quickly, WHO realized that it couldn't only address HIV, that um, the main risk of, of morbidity in HIV-positive uh, clients was actually tuberculosis. And so there's been a debate around how best to deliver programs. Should they be vertical? Or given very natural comorbidities, um, shouldn't we actually integrate programs? And, um, and initially, the funders were reluctant to do this. It's much easier to fund a vertical program, to have complete control of that program, ensure that all the funding that goes in is being used towards the particular outcome that, um, that one is hoping for. And, uh, and funders were, were very reluctant to actually support uh, integrated programs. But with time, that thinking changed. And, um, and then we had... Uh, some very interesting debates around how a vertical program could be used to actually strengthen the general health system, um, what's been termed the diagonal approach to health system strengthening. Um, the horizontal approach where, um, where a number of programs and diseases are, are, are treated and uh, managed from one service platform is not necessarily a comprehensive primary health care approach. Um, and I do want to make this point, um, it's an important one, that when we talk about uh, comprehensive, if we take a definition from one of the dictionaries this morning, I had a look at the Oxford Concise Dictionary and the Merriam-Webster Dictionary. Comprehensive is defined as that which includes all or most or, or many, um, whereas in the context of primary health care, there's a very particular understanding of what comprehensive primary health care is. And a comprehensive primary health care approach does not mean that we have all the services being offered under one roof or all the services being offered within one consulting room. Those services might all be curative and, pre and preventative, such as family planning and immunization. Uh, to be fully comprehensive, um, the services, the health system needs to include some action against the social determinants of the, the, the disease or the, the health problem as well. So it's a very particular meaning of 
comprehensive when we talk about comprehensive primary health care. So after two or three decades of implementing the selective primary health care approach, we do now have a recommitment to a more comprehensive primary health care approach. And we see this in the Millennium Development Goals, which with a return, um, the global community is more interested again in development more broadly. And so it includes focus on access to education, access to water and sanitation. And then, of course, there are particular health goals as well. Um, there's also been a Commission on Social Determinants, which was started in 2005 and ran, um, the report was published in 2008. And this commission um, says very clearly that uh, it's the conditions under which people live and work, uh, the daily living conditions that actually impact um, on their health. Um, and so that argues for a broader understanding of, of disease causation. Um, and then in 2008, we have the World Health Report, um, which advocates for a primary health care approach as a way of organizing um, health uh, systems and health services. And, and it's called Now More Than Ever. So acknowledging that it was there in the past, but the selective primary health care approach has not been as... Um, as successful as some of its early proponents had hoped in controlling disease. Um, more and more we re recognize the importance of the social determinants of health if we are actually going to make a difference. And that needs to be taken into consideration in our health programs and in our health systems. Um, I'd like to end by referring you to two articles which are in your reader. Um, these come from a Lancet series which looked... Uh, at primary health care. The series was called Alma Arta, Rebirth and Revision. Uh, it was published in 2008. Um, the first article in the series was written by Lorne and colleagues, and it looks at 30 years on. The first uh, article in the series is by Lorne and colleagues, and, um, and it's entitled Alma Arta, 30 Years On. Uh, revolutionary, relevant, and time to revitalize. And it presents a very good argument for a more comprehensive primary health care approach. Um, the fifth article in the series is also in your reader, and, and it highlights the importance of community participation um, and looks at lessons that this has for maternal, newborn, and, and child health. Thank you. Mm -hmm.